Thank you, Pastor Sean. It's a great privilege to be here. Happy Sabbath. Um, Pastor Sean, he mentioned that our lesson this week has the title of the least of these, which is interesting because the quarterly is also the least of these, right? This is a pretty broad study. Um, honestly, each one of the days of the lesson this week could, uh, could be a series of sermons, right? But we're called right now to have an overview of this. And I'd like to begin just saying that I feel that the lesson up to this point has been a buildup to this moment. The lesson has been a buildup. And what comes after this week's lesson is also uh, an aftermath of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. We've seen that God created a perfect world, and that was the first lesson. He created a perfect world, a world of harmony, a world where uh, the relationship between humans and God and humans with one another was a perfect, balanced relationship. We, fought, we saw also that that relationship was broken, the relationship with God and the relationship with each other that was broken by something called sin. And we've been seeing how God has planned and has tried to restore that, uh, those two relationships with each other. The memory verse this week comes from Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, and it says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. This week we find uh, basically four main subjects, three, uh, four scopes of study, and they are the Sermon on the Mount, and that includes the Beatitudes and overcoming evil with good. We find the parable of the Good Samaritan. We find the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And finally, we find um, that courtroom scene where Jesus describes the last day, the judgment day. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I love it that it begins, the author found it fit to begin with the Sermon on the Mount. And for a while, I, I was asking myself, well, why? He mentions the Sermon on the Mount, and then he goes into some parables. Why, uh, why this order? Why this order of study? And the reason for that is what we find in verse, ch Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, verse 2, where we read that Jesus, he begins this sermon. He starts this sermon and it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and he was seated. His disciples came to him. And when he was, was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And so Jesus goes into this sermon. Now what's interesting is that the book of Matthew um, Matthew was written for whom? Do you remember? Matthew was written for the Jewish nation. Each one of the Gospels has a specific target audience. And the book of Matthew was for the Jewish nation. That's why you find, for example, in the genealogy that we have of Jesus in Matthew, who, is, who does it go back to? Who was the first one? Not Adam. It goes back to Abraham. Why? Why? Because it was interesting, it was important for the Jewish nation to find a connection between the Messiah and Abraham, their father. You'll find that in the book of Luke that was written towards who? The Greek nation, the Gentiles. That's where the genealogy goes back to Adam. Because it was important for um, them to understand that Jesus, the Messiah, is the true son of man. And so he goes back to Adam. But in Matthew, he goes back to Abraham the father of the Jews, the father of the, the Jewish nation. Now, in that context, the first four chapters of Matthew, you'll find that the main subject is the description of the person of the king, the person of the Messiah. You have a description of Jesus, you have the genealogy, you, you have where he came from, you have the description of the king. But from chapter five onwards, we have a shift in the subject. You see, if up to chapter four you have the king, from chapter 5 all the way up to chapter 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount, you have the description of what it means to follow the king, the virtues of the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be a citizen of, the, a citizen of this kingdom? So while in the beginning you have the king, then there's a shift to what it means to follow the king. Who is this king? And the logic is clear. Those who accept him, they must know him. Those who accept Jesus must know who Jesus is. And here in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus appears as a new Moses. And this was important for the Jews to understand this. Jesus appears as a new Moses. He is bringing a new exodus, freedom from sin. 
Jesus is on a new mount, a new mountain, not the same mountain where Moses got his law. And Jesus is bringing, bringing a clear comprehension of the law. So you find that there is a great, um, there, there's a, 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 a connection, a relation between Moses and Jesus, the law, the old law, and Jesus' law, that's not a new law, but a better, a clear understanding of the law. He's on a new mount, and you have that relation between Jesus and Moses here. This chapter contains many known sections, and I'm sure that all of you have probably read books about this, heard sermons about this, studied lessons about the Sermon of the Mount, and this goes far because there's just so much packed into uh, so few chapters. So in this chapter, we find, in this in the sermon, we find the Beatitudes, we find the love for our enemies, we find the Lord's Prayer, we find the reference to the birds of the air and to the lilies of the fields, we find the golden rule, we find the narrow path, the parable of the builders. It is such a beautiful, deep, profound section of the Bible. And the point of the sermon, the po what Jesus is trying to get across to his listeners, um, what he's trying to define here is the Christian relationship between God and others. The relationship between Christians and God and Christians with each other. That's the point of the sermon. Jesus is trying to say this is how you should ha hold your relationship or have your relationship with God and how you should um, act or live upon your relationship with each other. And that's why Jesus begins with these Beatitudes. I'm saying that right, right? Beatitudes? Okay, you guys, you guys have to help me with my pronunciation. This is why Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. Since the point is to define Christian relationship with God and Christian relationship with each other, just like the Ten Commandments, these Beatitudes are divided in two segments. I didn't know if you know this, but the Beatitudes are divided into two segments. The first four, they have to do primarily with our relationship with God, and the latter four have to do primarily with our relationship with each other. For example, those that have to do with God are, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall see God. Sorry, uh, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. These are the beatitudes that have to do with my relationship with God, primarily. They have to do with me and God. And the, the, the latter four, blessed are the merciful, for they, shall be, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persec persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are the, the virtues, the beatitudes that have to do with my relationship with others around me. My relationship with people around me. So you can see that. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers. Who does that have to do with? Me? and the world around me that is in chaos. So the Christian who acts as a peacemaker, who brings peace to a, a hostile work environment, or a home filled with anger and strife, someone who brings peace is promised that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you see how these, uh, just as the Ten Commandments have to do with me and God, and me and my, uh, my neighbor, these Beatitudes have to do with me and God, and me and my neighbor. These eight characteristics, they identify Christians. Actually, they form up the profile of what it means to be a Christian. Now, differently from the spiritual gifts, and some people compare them, you know, the Beatitudes with the spiritual gifts, differently from the spiritual gifts, where the spiritual gifts, they're given just a few to each person. So uh, we find in the Bible, in the New Testament, where it says, you know, to some it was given the gift of what? Of evangelism. To others it was given the gift of prophecy. And others have the gift of healing. And other ha others have the gift of speaking in tongues. So the Christians, us, we receive one or the other. Some have two or three, but rarely you'll find someone that has all the spiritual gifts. I've never met one. And that's good that it's like that. It's good that we are, each one of us, we're good at something different. But when it comes to these virtues, these eight characteristics of what it means to be a Christian, you can't have a Christian that is a peacemaker, but a Christian who is not pure in heart. You can't have a Christian who is poor in spirit, but, not, but in the same Christian, he is, not, uh, he is not hungry for righteousness or hungry, hunger and thirst for righteousness. So these characteristics, they make up what it means to be a Christian. All of them. In the same way as in the law, you can't honor one and break the other. That can't happen. 
It's the same with these beatitudes. These virtues, these characteristics, they define what it means to be a Christian. And that's why Jesus mentions them here at the beginning of this this great sermon of his. They define what it means to be a Christian. And the key word, the key word here is the word blessed. This word blessed comes from the Greek makarios, which means joyful, happy, and happy for a specific reason. We're not just happy for anything. We're happy because we pertain to the realm of God's government. We are happy because we are citizens of the kingdom. You see, what's interesting when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, and you'll find that in the book of Matthew, Jesus repeats over and over and over again the, the following phrase. And so the kingdom, kingdom of heaven is likened unto. And then he tells a parable. You see, in Jesus' in Jesus's words, the kingdom of heaven isn't primarily a place. It isn't primarily a geography. The kingdom of heaven to Jesus, primarily, is a relationship with the king. That's what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Primarily, the kingdom of heaven is not a place, but a relationship with the king, with the person of the king. When we get to, um, to the, the, the main part of chapter 5, uh, when we find overcoming evil with good, um, this is in chapter 5, verse 38 through 45. And we're going to read a few of these verses where it says here, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other also to him. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Jesus was always controversial, at least always on the left-hand side of what we would imagine the norm. Who would preach, do good to those who do evil to you? Love your enemies. Who could live by those standards, naturally? It's difficult. We see this in the world around us. When someone does evil, what 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 do we want? Revenge, right? But Jesus, he sets the bar higher over here. Jesus sets the bar higher. This, uh, this law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, this is quoting from the Old Testament, and it's called the lex talionis. Uh, that's, that's the name of this law, um, the lex talionis. And it means it's a law of revenge. In many people's mouth, a tooth for a tooth and, eye and, a, and an eye for an eye. And, and uh, I've heard it said that if, if we take that literally, we'll have a world full of, of uh, toothless people and blind, toothless blind people. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What we find in the Old Testament when we read this text is that honestly, what is being said, what God is teaching the nation of Israel is that this is a measure of justice. If you take an eye, I won't take your whole body. I won't take an arm. What will be taken? An eye. It's a measure of justice. But Jesus, again, he sets the bar higher. Now, there's one thing that I really want us to understand. Most of the Protestant world around us the evangelical world around us, they believe right here that Jesus is doing what? He is giving a new law. Have you heard someone say this before? Here, this is the new law. This is Jesus' new law. And that's what we are under today. But that is, that is not correct for a few reasons. First of all, you find in verse um, 38, you find, for example, where, that Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. Do you see that here? You have heard that it was said. Also, you'll find this in verse 43. You have heard that it was said. What is Jesus referencing here? What is Jesus referencing? Most people will say that he's referencing the Old Testament. And that's why he is laying down a new law. It was said to you this. But I tell you this. And because of that, many many, uh, Christians in the world around us will say that Jesus is giving us a new law. Jesus is not quoting scripture here. When he says you have heard, he's not quoting scripture. 
You see, in Jesus' day, and, and actually before that even, there were two main schools of thought amongst the Jews. You had the, the Shimei school and the Hillel school. Shimei and Hillel. Shem, sh sorry, Shammai and Hillel. Now, the Shammai school, the Shammai line of thought, it was more traditional, more Bible-based. While the Hillel um, train of, of thought, the Hillel school, was more liberal. It was more liberal. And most of the Pharisees, they were from the Hillel school. Now, in the years, in the centuries preceding Jesus, the Jewish nation had um, established something called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah were a series of laws, series of laws that protected the main law, the main code of the Bible. So that's where you'll find many rabbinic teachings that are not in the Bible. So for example, when Jesus says in verse 43, you have heard that it was says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Where in the Bible do you find this? Absolutely nowhere. It's not in the Bible. This comes from the Mishnah. This comes from the rabbinic traditional code where they said you have heard where they said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy Jesus isn't saying anything new when he answers this when he says but I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you and do go good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you is Jesus saying anything new or is he quoting from scripture he's quoting from scripture Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy do you remember in the temptation of the desert when Jesus always answers with, it is written, it is written, it is written? You see, Jesus, he doesn't come to, to give a new teaching. He, gives, he comes to confirm that which was already taught. So you'll find that these, uh, these two, you, you'll find these two realities in the New Testament in Jesus' terms. You'll find that when Jesus says, you have heard, Jesus isn't talking about the Bible. He's not quoting scripture. But when he says it was written or have you not read, these are the two formulas that you find in Jesus' mouth. You'll find that he says it is written or you'll find have you not read? Jesus then is quoting scripture. And here he is quoting scripture. The character characteristics of the kingdom of heaven were revolutionary. No one had ever taught anything like this. At least no one recent. No one had ever taught anything like this. It was revolutionary. Jesus was constantly bringing new, not necessarily new teachings, but a fresh teaching. A fresh teaching. When Jesus speaks of overcoming evil with good, compassion and mercy were not a part of the norms of his time. They weren't a part of the norms. The Romans despised the ideas of mercy. They saw it as weakness. The Jewish nation, the Jews, they dreamed of what? Revenge against those who had wronged them. The religious class, the Pharisees, they dress themselves up in their own rigid, severe, rigorous self-righteousness. Suffering. Look at this. Even suffering, which, you know, when human suffering, usually what does human suffering evoke in us? What, is, what are the feelings? Empathy. Pity. In those days, human suffering was seen as a, it was seen as a deserved punishment. Do you remember in John chapter 9 when Jesus and his disciples are passing through that man that was born blind? What question do the disciples ask Jesus? Who sinned? <laughs> that, was their, that was what they thought. That was their mindset. Who sinned? Was it him or his parents that God should punish him so? So you see that mercy and compassion, these weren't ideals by which anyone lived by, be them Roman or Greek or Jew. But here Jesus describes that the citizens of his kingdom are those who defeat evil with kindness. Defeat evil with kindness. Perhaps one of the best examples of this that we find in the Bible comes in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'd like to shift to this story right now. This is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 um, onwards. I'm going to read the first two verses, 25, 26, and 27. The first three verses, 25, 26, and 27. And this is what we read here. And behold, a certain lawyer, and the word lawyer here can be translated as an expert in the law. Okay? A lawyer, expert in the law, he stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
This is one of the best examples of what Jesus was talking about. This is a very interesting parable. It's an exclusive parable to the book of Luke. You only find this parable in the book of Luke. What's interesting is that you also find that there are a few connections between the character found in this parable and the author of the book. Both were Gentiles. The Samaritan, he wasn't Jewish. Luke wasn't Jewish. Luke has the distinction of being the only non-Jew uh, author, Jewish author of the New Testament. And this story is told as an answer that this expert in the law asks Jesus where he says, well then who is my neighbor? We covered this four weeks ago when I passed the lesson last, when I te taught the lesson last time. Um, this man, he, he, he asks this question as what? As a justification because Jesus had called him out. And so as a justification, to justify himself, himself, the Bible says, he asks this question. Well then who is my neighbor? Now why do you imagine that he's asking this question? Who is my neighbor? This wasn't a new question. This was a very controversial subject amongst the rabbis of Jesus' day. Because they wanted to define who is the neighbor. Because once you define who the neighbor is, what can you then do? You can exclude those who are not the neighbor. If I can define who my neighbor is, then I know who, my, who, who is not my neighbor. And if I know who is not my neighbor, I know who I have to treat well and who I can neglect, who I don't have to care about. So Jesus tells this story. He doesn't answer the question outright. And this was Jesus' way. He wouldn't give the answer easy. He made people think. You see, Jesus was the master of removing people from the audience and placing them on the stage. Jesus was a master at that. At exposing people's wrong thoughts. And teaching them. Helping them understand what was the truth of the kingdom of heaven. When we get to the parable, and we're not going to read the whole parable here. You all know this parable You've heard it your whole life. But when we arrive in this parable, one thing that's fascinating is that Jesus doesn't give a big description of the victim. He says, and a certain man was coming from, Jericho to Jeru from Jerusalem to Jericho. And that's all you have. We don't know if he was rich or poor. We don't know whose father he was. We don't know if he was well connected. We don't know if he had a, a family. We don't know what his profession was. We don't know from the Bible if he was Jewish or not. What we know is that there was a man coming from Jerusalem, going to Jericho. That's all you find about this man. Who was this man? Apparently here, he's anonymous. Jesus deliberately does this. Deliberately eliminates any possibility of identification. The fallen man is even incapable of asking for help. He can't even help himself. He's completely helpless at the total mercy of the others that pass him by. And you find three others. You find the priest, you find the Levite, and you find a third man. When the priest passes him by, what does he do? He goes straight forward. Perhaps this priest was scared of ceremoni ceremonial unclean uncleanliness, impurity. You see, the, the rabbinical code of those days had come up with this, with this uh, theory, this, this term, or this belief of impurity by association. This is not biblical. It's impurity by association. Which means that just by being close to something impure, I can then by association become impure. Why do you think that, for example, Peter, he is very reluctant to go to Cornelius' house? Because it was taboo, it was impure. You would become impure by even entering a Gentile's house. Where is that in the Bible? Nowhere. That's rabbinical teaching. And so this priest, perhaps, afraid of becoming impure, and he who was holy, he had to do with the temple and the sanctuary, he didn't want to uh, become impure, and so he passes by. We find a second, a second uh, person here. Who? The Levite. The Levites were a second class of, uh, of clergy. They had responsibilities also in the temple and in the major cities. They were very religious. They were a tribe, of re a religious tribe. This man, this Levite, he also passes by. Perhaps this was one of those Christians that sees suffering and he says a word of prayer. Oh dear Lord, please have mercy on his soul. But he continues on. Oh Lord, please have mercy on his soul. But he continues on. Maybe scared of the bandits. This was a very dangerous area. Right? The path from Jericho to Jerusalem was a path of about 17 miles of distance. And it was full of ups and downs and caves where many bandits, it was called the bloody path. 
just for you to see, the bloody path, because it was so dangerous. So perhaps this Levite, afraid of uh, the bandits, afraid of anything that might happen to him, he walks on by. Now, this third character that appears in the story, um, Jesus' listeners, they were expecting that this character was a lay Jew, a lay Israelite. That's what they were expecting. That would make sense. A layman, Israelite, someone who had no ties to the religious establishment, nothing, but was a good man. That's what they would expect. But the text says, it tells us here, a certain, what? Samaritan. And here, my friends, we lose, we lose um, the strength of the illustration. We, we lose notion or, or the idea of the illustration because we can't, today, 2,000 years later, we, we have a hard time truly understanding how great the hostility between these two nations was. Um, and if you just want to see what I'm talking about, when I say the word Samaritan, what do you think of? What's the word that comes to mind? Good. <laughs> Good. That's what you hear. Oh, he was a Samaritan. If someone says that today, oh, he was a Samaritan. What does that mean? He was good. He, he did something good because he was a good Samaritan. But in those days, good and Samaritan were the last thing anyone would ever imagine about Samaritans. The Samaritans, just for you to understand, the Samaritans, they were a hybrid race. They were a mixture of the Jewish nation that had been exiled and all the other pagan nations around them. They were cursed publicly and in synagogues. They could not be accepted as proselytes. They could not be converted to Judaism. They could not, they had no part in the resurrection or in the eternal life. They had no part in this. Their witness was not acceptable in a court of law. Their food, eating their food to a Jewish, to an Israelite, it was worse than eating pork. Their women were considered impure. They could not become responsible for uh, an Israelite orphan. These were the Samaritans, hated, hated. And he is who Jesus uses as a perfect example of love. He's the only non-religious of the story, the only one. He had every reason to turn away, every reason. But he decides to become involved. And Jesus adds details to this story. Jesus says that this man used his own supplies to treat the victim. Jesus says that he, he used his own animal to transport him. The story tells us that when he arrives in the inn, he pays from his own pocket. He pays for, uh, for this man's days in the inn. And he says, he tells the owner of the inn, look, if he wastes, if he uses anything more, if he spends, if there's any other expense, I will pay from my own pocket. My friends, this is not mere humanitarianism. This is Christian love. This is what Jesus was talking about. This is not mere humanitarianism. And Jesus ends the parable with that first question, the question that was given to him, who is my neighbor? But Jesus twists it a little, Jesus changes that question a little bit. Because if that question, who is my neighbor, is, an exclu is an, a question of exclusion, Jesus' answer or Jesus' question back to the expert of the law is a question of all inclusion. Because Jesus, he changes the subject of the question. Who was the neighbor of him who fell? That is how Jesus gives the question back. Who was the neighbor of him who fell? Do you see how Jesus changes the question? To Jesus, the neighbor is not the object of the deed. Understand this. To Jesus, to Jesus, the neighbor is not the object of the deed, but the subject. It is he who practices the deed. The neighbor is not he who receives the good deed, but he who practices it. What does that tell you? Is the question, who is my neighbor, the correct question? No. The true question is, well, who am I the neighbor to? Do you see the change in the question? It's not someone else that is my neighbor. I have to act as the neighbor. I must be the neighbor. That is what Jesus is teaching here. How to overcome evil with good. This man had everything to turn away. But he becomes personally involved. An example of how God treated us, this world. Where he became personally involved. Personally responsible for all of us. Amen? The next story that we find, the next parable that we find in this week's lesson, in the least of these, is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And this appears in Luke chapter 16. I like that these, these different parables, they appear in the book of Luke. My name is Lucas, and my father gave me this name because of the book of Luke. 
he was studying the book of Luke for his thesis and, uh, and he was studying the, you know, the, everything that was happening here and he became mesmerized with Luke. And that's why my name is Lucas today. So I find interesting that these different parables, these parables that you only find in Luke, um, well, these are the parables that you only, find, you only find in Luke. If I could rename this parable, I would rename it as the neighbors who never met. The rich men and Lazarus. The neighbors who never met. This is, this is quite an exclusive parable because, well, amongst other reasons, this is the only parable where you find that Jesus gives a name to one of the characters. Did you know that? This is the only parable that you'll find in the Bible where Jesus gives a name to one of the characters. And the name was Lazarus. Lazarus. Now the Bible doesn't tell us the name of the rich man, but Jewish tradition tells us, uh, well, Jewish tradition calls this man in the parable, Deves. All right? It's not in the Bible, and that's probably not what his name was, but the Jewish tradition called him Deves, which literally means rich man. The, the word Deves literally means rich man, and that's what they called him. So for the sake of the parable, that's what we'll call him. We'll call him Deves, which means rich man. They probably passed each other many times. Multiple times. But Lazarus was invisible to Deves. And Jesus, he spares no words describing the situation here. Lazarus surviving on meager charity, full of sores, probably disabled. Dogs would come to lick his wounds. What does that tell you? I mean, the easiest thing for anybody when a dog comes or, you know, or something like that, or a fly comes and, and lands on you, what? You swat it away. You push it away. But this man was incapable of defending himself. Helpless, defenseless. Hungry. Scripture tells us that he wanted to feed himself with what? The crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Do you know what crumbs these were? Bread. In those days, in Jesus' days, they were used both as a fork or a spoon and as a napkin. And would be tossed away. This man desired, he longed to fill his stomach with what? The napkins used by others at the table. Now many people have tried to use this parable to defend their idea of the immortality, immortality of the soul. You've probably heard this, right? Many people use this parable to defend the idea of immortality of the soul. But there are a few serious problems with this. That someone would have to navigate through these problems to actually you know, use this, this parable for that reason. For example, Romans 6.23, all of you know this, the wages of sin is what? Death. Does the Bible tell us that the wages of sin is life in hell? Is that what the Bible is saying? The wages of sin is life in hell? No. The wages of sin is death. And the right, the right next sentence, the following sentence, is that the, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. So here, eternal life and eternal death are placed in a contrast. Otherwise, we would have both kinds of eternal life. Eternal life in heaven and eternal life in hell. But does the Bible teach that? Of course not. Of course not. That's not what the Bible is saying here. Uh, maybe another problem with this interpretation would be, what kind of heaven is this? Is, is it possible, would it be possible for me to arrive in heaven and then just look over this chasm and on the other side see my loved ones suffering? What kind of heaven would that be? If I would get there and I would see perhaps a brother or a sister or someone that I love, they're um, suffering, burning for all eternity. What kind of heaven would this be? I don't know if I would want to go to this heaven. Would it be possible, for example, for me to take a piece of bread and throw it over the chasm for someone that's in, that, in, that, uh, in hell? Would it be possible for me to wet my finger and, and you know, let them lick it for, for water? What kind of heaven would this be? No, friends, Jesus here, he is speaking figuratively. It's figurative language taken from the common notions from, that had penetrated the Jewish uh, post-exile Judaism under Greek philosophy. That's, that's where this story, this notion comes from. And Jesus corrects it, but Jesus uses it. We have, and basically what Jesus is saying here, basically what Jesus is using this story for is to teach us a very basic lesson. We have one life to serve. Only one life. The chance that we have to serve is here and now. Right here, right now. And that is while we are alive. That is the story that Jesus is trying to convey. The good we must do, 
we must do now while the door of life is open. The cynics might have laughed at Lazarus. You know what Lazarus means, the name? My God, my God is my help. Or the Lord is my help. God is my help. That's what the name Lazarus means. And cynics might have laughed. Look at Lazarus here suffering. And this is an emblem for another Lazarus, is it not? Who also died. The cynics might have laughed at Lazarus. God is my help. Maybe not at Lazarus, but at his God. Where is your God, O Lazarus? That apparently is helping no one. There are millions in the world suffering. Where is your God? The problem here, my friends, is not with God. The problem is with, is with his so-called stewards, humans. That's where the problem is at. You see, God created a world with enough sustenance for all. Did he not? But one thing that God did not create was a world with enough sustenance for the greed of all. While around 850 million people every year suffer from chronic undernourishment, approximately 1.3 billion tons of food go to waste every year. 1.3 billion tons. About one third of every, of all food produced for human consumption, which amounts to about one trillion dollars, every year goes to waste. The problem is not with God. The problem is with his so-called stewards, humanity. And that's why Jesus, when he's talking about the least of these, after introducing the virtues, the characteristics of, the, of his, of his uh, citizens, of the citizens of his kingdom, after exemplifying through these parables and many others what it truly means to love your neighbor, to be a citizen of the kingdom, Jesus then describes this, this courtroom scene. This appears in Matthew 25. We're going to read verses 35. And it says, For I was hungry, 35 through 40, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When, Lord, did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, in it one to the least of these of my brethren, you have done it unto me. What's interesting here, and please bear with me because this becomes kind of tricky. What's interesting is that the final test of religion, at least here, is not religiosity, but love. You see, Matthew 25, Jesus brings us a judgment scene. Jesus is sitting upon the throne. The nations of the world are brought before him. And on that day, the question will not be, we don't see this here in this judgment scene described by Jesus, the question will not be if we believed that's not what it's saying here. But if we loved, and please again bear with me. Don't believe that I'm teaching here a kind of, you know, salvation by works. There's no contradiction here with faith. I'm not talking about salvation by works. The heart of the matter is, did your belief lead to love? Do you see? Did your belief lead to love? In the end, it's not ultimately what I believed in that saves me, but if what I believed in was capable of transforming me. Do you see? It's not ultimately what you believe, but did what you believe was, was what you believe capable of changing you, of transforming you. That is what Jesus is saying here. Belief becomes faith at the point of action. Belief becomes faith at the point of action. It's not enough to believe. Satan believes. Belief becomes faith at the point of action. You understand? In that last final day of judgment, Jesus will not mention what we usually consider the big sins. Sin, sin is transgression of the law, as we find in 1 John. But as we find in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the purpose of the law is what? Love. The purpose of the law is love. You see, denying love is denying the spirit of Christ. And that is the ultimate proof that we never knew him. 
that he never lived in us. Denying love means that he never inspired our deeds. He never motivated our lives. Despite our great religious pretensions and our great religious speeches, denying the love that I have lived in myself, for myself, and only thought of myself. And so it will be in the end. In the presence of the Son of Man, his humanity will judge our inhumanity. That spectacle will be terrible when his burning eyes penetrate through all those false pretenses, when those that lived as Jesus had never, as if Jesus had never lived, will feel naked under his gaze without any masks or hiding places. And there we will meet once again with those who either we loved or those who we neglected, who we ignored, who we treated with contempt. No witnesses will be necessary. No accusations. The words that will be heard that day will not come from theology, but from life. Not from the church. Not even from the Bible. Not from religion. But from those who crossed our path through life. From those who we gave out cups of water of we, that we visited, that we clothed, all in the name of Christ. I'd like to end with a text coming from Isaiah chapter 58 verse 6 and 7 and this is what it says. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor that are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. You see, sometimes, my friends, we become so preoccupied with something called orthodoxy. Do you know what orthodoxy means? Correct belief. The word orthodoxy means correct belief. We become so preoccupied with orthodoxy that we forget something called orthopraxis. Correct behavior. The correct praxis. We forget orthopraxis. Which is why this prophet here, he severely rebuked the Israelites of Jesus of, of the Old Testament times. And these were people very similar to us. These were people that were very interested, were very, were very, um, uh, they were very, they found it very important to follow the correct day of worship. The day of rest, the day of atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary. They were very zealous about the health code. But so much so that they forgot about orthopraxis about how to treat the poor, how to treat the widows. And do you see that the terminology used in Isaiah is the same that Jesus used? Clothing the poor, giving them food, giving them water, visiting them, harboring, uh, harboring an orphan. That's the, the terminology here that Isaiah uses. The final exam will not be ba based primarily on our orth ortho orthodoxy, but our orthopraxis. That, uh, that is what the lesson taught this week when it comes to the least of these. It exemplifies all these things. That's the time that we have for today. I would like to thank you for uh, joining us here in the local church. Also, thank you that joined us um, through the internet. And we'll be waiting for you again at next week's Sabbath School Study Hour. May God bless you.